All right, welcome everybody. This is Barney Kunsi from Ontario, Canada in the northern Winter Wonderland. And um, Winter Wonderland, the Winter Wonderland. <laughs> um, the cold weather is affecting my speech ability. But uh, so thank you for all of you who are joining in here now. Um, it's a, just a couple minutes after one, so we're gonna jump straight in to our live weekly uh, coaching call. And for those of you who are new to these coaching calls that we're having every week, um, we had originally set these up for our VIP members and they were so good. Um, they were reserved just for our paid members that they're now open to everybody. So you can join them live. You can listen to the replay. You can share them. Um, they're on our YouTube channel and also in the members area. For those of you who are members, you can easily access them there. And what's really cool about this is that every week from here on, as long as we have great topics to talk about. So I think pretty much forever these are going to go. Um, these coaching calls were designed with you in mind because we receive a lot of questions on a weekly basis uh, about your pet's health, your animal's health and well-being and the questions about this and questions about that. And, you know, as amazing as the Animal Wellness Summit has been and is, um, the challenge, because there's there's a uh, two sides to every coin, right? Just as the sun comes up, it goes down and the moon comes out. And the metaphor there is, is that there's always a dark side as there is to the light side. The sun was amazing, but the dark side was that it was so much information um, all at once that it was actually quite overwhelming for people, uh, not only including us as being your hosts and administrators of the event, but also the great presenters like we have uh, Petra Christensen, who's on here with us today from Arizona. And um, so these weekly coaching calls are really amazing because it allows us to keep interacting with you and serving you uh, throughout the whole year. So um, I just want to also let you know before I bring uh, Petra in here today that uh, you can post your questions down below. Um, if it's something timely, we will do our best to make sure we get to it. Uh, we love the interaction, so please just drop us a line and let us know where you're tuning in live from now um, around the world. Uh, I think our record so far has been nine countries on one call live at one given time, which is pretty cool. Um, so just let us know that, and uh, we're going to be talking about uh, natural horse habitat and some other neat things that Petra has up her sleeve. And so I'm going to bring Petra in. I'm going to hit the magic button here. And welcome, Petra. Hey, can you see me? Yeah, we can see you. You cut out there for just a brief second. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So thank you so much for hosting me, Barney. I really appreciate it. Um, natural horse habitat was really the theme of our mini masterclass. And it was the first one, and I'm excited yeah. that um, we get to talk a little bit more about that, as well as Genuine Connections, which is really my overall program that um, I am working with. And that has four building blocks, and the yeah. natural habitat is the first one. Very cool, and yes, and thank you for the reminder. So um, we are also doing, in addition to the live weekly coaching calls, these monthly mini masterclasses, which are short focused uh, mini trainings on a specific topic that people that we've we've noticed is there's a high level of interest in them. And so they're included in uh, the VIPs and, and platinum membership. So I saw Jennifer O'Brien's on here. So welcome, Jennifer. Um, at least I think you're still on. Um, and that they're included with your membership. But those of you who are not members yet, or if you're don't ever choose to be the neat part is you can actually decide which one of these uh, trainings or master classes you want to take. And uh, Patriots was really interesting. I had a lot of great realizations going through your training. Um, so without giving everything away, can you just give us like a brief synopsis of the natural horse habitat? Uh, because I know that there's a lot of people who are on here who probably have heard your presentations from the last two years, but I also know that there's probably people that have no idea a who this crazy bald headed, looking guys from Canada, but also who uh, you are. So tell us just a little bit, you can just give us a brief little, <laughs> I do have hair, I just choose to shave my head because it's a little <laughs> Um And as Dr. Bernie Siegel said to me, he said, uh, it's a sign of spiritual wisdom. So I'm like, I didn't know that, but that's what he said. So I'll, I'll take the compliment. <laughs> hey. <laughs> so tell us a little bit more, just briefly your, your story and the natural horse habitat. And then you had said you'd had some interesting questions come your way and then let's get into that. Yeah, so a uh, natural horse habitat actually started way back in the 80s um, when I was still in Germany and I had my horses boarded at a farm that was working with a technical university in Munich. 
And what they were trying to do was set up a system that allowed farmers to have a complementary income when it comes to horse boarding. And the idea was to make it artgerecht, which in German means species appropriate. So I got to participate in this study. And of course, it was done in a way where um, the farmer wanted to have as little work as possible with the horses. So there was a lot of feed uh, automation and so on. And I'm teaching genuine connections. So I really encourage everybody to use the opportunity of those daily interactions that we have with our horses on the natural horse habitat to build consistent connection. But that's how it all started. And that's how this idea was born because just like here in the US, in Germany too, a lot of horses are um, locked up in a 12 by 12 stall and they don't have, are being able to really live with nature how nature intended them to live and so that's the whole idea of natural horse habitat is when we're looking at genuine connections that we want to keep our horses foundational needs in mind and these really are that our horses are herd members they're family members and a lot of times the way we board our horses the way we keep our horses we turn them into individuals and we're actually uh, limiting their social interactions. We're also limiting their movement and we're limited the amount of time that they're eating, which then in return causes horse problems because the horse isn't a happy camper and we wanting to have a partner, we're not setting ourselves up for success if we do not keep our horse's needs in mind. So with a natural horse habitat, there are seven building blocks that are really designed to be horse and user and pocket and environmentally friendly. So we talked about that in the mini masterclass as well as in the last Animal Wellness Summit from 2018. And so 2017, if you were a member of the Animal Wellness Summit, I talked more about the three remaining uh, building blocks of Genuine Connections, which is healthy physiology for horse as well as human, wholehearted communication and fearless insight. So this is, basically four building blocks that my logo is a circle that build on each other interact with each other and also make a spiral upwards where you can really create more and more genuine connections with those four building blocks so. yeah that's that's really great and i what i love most about that uh, i know that we talked i think we talked about this in our the call that we did before um before the, the the little like intro call before we did the monthly mini masterclass so you had mentioned about that with the circle and and i don't know if you guys you as and everybody listening even for you petra but our um our my company name is full circle holistic health and the our the mission and vision for full circle holistic health is to help people bring their health and their wealth a complete full circle and i look at uh, things in holistic health um, is that the the our bot our system the systems in our body are uh, there is a lot to do with circuits or in circles um, so there's a lot of different uh, analogies that can be made when it comes to health and holism uh, regarding circles so I just I find that really unique and it makes a lot of sense to me um, when you say that when you look at our logo it's designed like the circle the YL success summit the uh, animal wellness summit the full circle. Um, and I'm just sharing that because I think it's neat because it it makes it like, you know, it completes the the parts that are the pieces of your philosophy and the modules that come together like pieces of a puzzle and a circle in geometry is a very strong um, uh, sign. Yes. Yes. Love it. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So, um, so you said you had some uh, interesting questions. You had some things that kind of came up that you wanted to talk about. I had I had some funny uh, comments too. Um, I I know a student of mine emailed me that you know she either has the choice to rip everything out, and and get a divorce, um, in the process, <laughs> <laughs> or do with what she has. And um, I've previously had visited her 
uh, her setup and it's a great setup, you know? And so what I would really like to encourage everybody is that you simply look at the ingredients, look at the trail system and the philosophy of the uh, play pastures and the habitat shelter and natural feeding and manure management and ecological landscaping and natural care and see how you can take the principles and apply that to what you already have, right? That's the whole idea. You can um, address your horse's needs in, in any given situation. And sometimes, you know, it's a little bit better and sometimes it's just what, we're, what we have and we're making the best out of it. So my intern, Julie, she uh, interned with me through the Scottsdale uh, College for Equine Science. And so she visited me in Pagosa Springs where my other property is. So that's where I have the trail system and uh, the natural horse habitat. It's on 2.24 acres up in the mountains um, at uh, 7,500 feet. And here we are in Arizona at about 3,500 feet. So very different climate. And um, so my intern Julie is in Arizona and she's currently boarding her horse and her horse really really took to the you know to the whole idea of being able to move more and being fed all day and she could really see a difference in her horse's behavior and she was just there for a week you know and we did not integrate her into the to herd with within a week it just doesn't make sense um but she got to participate in the larger area and the other horses were around and so on and so julie went home and implemented as much as she could in the boarding situation she talked to the owner of the facility and see what was possible and now she is using small hole hay nets and her horse has hay in front of her all day and she was able to move her to a bigger paddock that also has a gate to the arena so there's some more turnout and the horses are also the other horses are being turned out into the arena so there's more interaction and um, a little bit more variety going on and she said that out of all of that she sees a real difference in her horse's daily behavior and also her horse always had problems with stocking up on the hind legs where there was um you know fluid retention in the hind legs and that's completely gone right so you know she didn't divorce her husband <laughs> she didn't move <laughs> you know that everything necessary. just yeah i know you know um so everything you know she stayed in the place that she was she just made the best out of it and so going back to asking questions if you have a current setup and you 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 kind of look at this and you're like you know i would really like to look more at my horse's needs and i really want to integrate and how can i do that here you're always welcome to either post a comment right now if you have one or if you think about it later you know email me at magic at peterchristensen.com and and i'm happy to give you my input right it's really important to me that people know that the genuine connections thing i really want to connect with you guys and i really want you guys to connect with me and sharing asking questions making comments even sharing your aha moments right Whenever we share something, we write something down, we're really integrating that knowledge uh, that we just learned. So I really welcome that interaction. Yeah, that's great. Um, the movement part, you know, the connection and the relationship, um, as you, you refer to it a lot, the genuine connection. Um, I mean, it's important, obviously, for us as human beings to maintain those connections um, with our fellow human beings and friends and family members. Um, and then of course with our animals, but I think what's unique about the movement part that you were talking with the design of the habitat for your horses on your property is that movement <clears throat> is so important. So depending on, depending on your setup or if you have your horse uh, boarded somewhere or if you have them on your property, um, you know, I just always kind of find it interesting when you would share it about your intern um, you know, and she was there and then the horse was better and the fluid retention went down and the movement was better and the behavior just kind of everything changed. Um, well, it's the same way with us as human beings, but just how important uh, movement is. Uh, and for me as being an exercise guy, I'm 
maybe sound biased with this, but I think that I just, it changes regardless whether you go to an actual gym and lift weights or do yoga and cardio training or whatever, but some form of daily movement and exercise, our bodies were designed to move or animals were, and pets are designed to move. And I mean, I saw that firsthand with our little dog, Lucy, when we had her that um, in the winter time, I wouldn't be able to take her out to walk as much and, you know, great white North. And uh, when there's two feet of snow up here, she's a little puppy, a little dog, 20, 30 pound dog. And uh, we did eventually actually end up getting her like a little coat and some boots to be able to take her out, but she wouldn't last long, but she was different. You know, her, her mood and demeanor and behavior was different in the winter time. And yeah. she was in the summertime. We'd go to the park and we'd play. I'd take her out for runs and walks. And I think that's, so all of that to say that just to talk about it, to expand that part outward of the importance and the impact of movement on our animals. Yeah, and it's, you know, when, when you look at horses out in the wild, you know, here in the U.S., we've got the Mustangs that we can somehow relate to. And, um, you know, we can discuss whether those are feral horses or true wild horses. But in the end, the horses that live in a herd environment, that live in a family, that move and eat and move and eat all day, horses, you know, sleep about two hours a day. And um, we need to look at these primary needs in order to, to really have a good partner, because when we don't fulfill the needs of our partner, how can we create a foundation for them to, to do what we want them to do? I saw the other day on Facebook a video, and it, I have to admit, it looked funny. You know, it was a horse that was blanketed, and it was, it was jumping up and down like a little goat, you know, like goats do out of fun. And I looked at that video and I looked at the setup and what I realized was that the horse had a very small paddock and at least it was a paddock and it was an open stall area where the horse could go in and out. But in the end, what happened was the horse wanted to move so badly that it jumped up and down like a little goat. And that's not something that horses do out in nature, you know, and so we can really see that we're restricting the horse. And so how can this horse, when we take it out, be a good riding partner? You know, I just don't see that we are setting our, ourselves up for success when we do that, because we're having behavioral problems that stem out of keeping our horses this way. So that's why healthy physiology and that goes right back to the movement. You know, it's not just healthy physiology for the horse, of course. The horse needs to have healthy physiology in order to carry us and needs to carry us in a biomechanically sound way because the horse isn't really built to to carry humans in the first place so we need to help them to move appropriately but how do we do that you know if we don't exercise ourselves if if we have a hard time moving our body and if we're not a hundred percent flexible and in balance our horse cannot be in balance there's just no way especially when we're on them because our horses tend to mirror them and if we're crooked Horse is crooked, right? right. And we don't even notice, right? So I use several modalities to really address that for the horse and for the human that we balance ourselves mentally, emotionally, and physically, which then goes back to that little full circle that you're also promoting, Barney, right? Right. Because yeah. I believe our body and the horse's body has to be set up in a certain way in order to wholeheartedly communicate if we carry brace if our horse carries brace if we are full of tension you know if we're maybe afraid and we don't really know how to interact with our horse or our horse does crazy things and you know we're really afraid for our safety and we don't know why the horse is doing it um there is a level of balance that we need to have in order to have wholehearted communication because when there is brace, we're holding back. When there is brace in the horse, there is fear and there is no relaxation possible if either us or the horse are afraid or tense or tight for whatever reason, right? Because we also carry, you know, our daily interactions that we have into our conversations with our horses, right? You know, we, our horse knows what kind of mood we're in. You know, if we had a really wonderful morning where we really took care of ourselves and we, you know, we listened to something that was really positive, we had a healthy breakfast, we really got up in a way where we had a lot of good sleep and we're going out to our horse and we really want to enjoy that connection. 
or whether, you know, we're running home from work and we're shoving ourselves some McDonald's burger in and, you know, some kind of soda and, and we're running to the barn and we have an agenda and we want to do something. See how I'm even, you know, clenching my fists when I do that? It creates tension. And our horse knows that being a prey animal, they're very perceptive to that. And what then happens is we're having a certain reaction, a certain response, and it's really, really important to look what our horse is doing and how they're acting and what their body language is telling us so that we can then respond. And we can only respond if we are also free of fear and brace. You know, brace could also be, you know, oh, my horse is doing this to me, you know, you know, it's not, it's not doing it to us. It's just giving us feedback. It's res <clears throat> responding and reacting. Yes. Yeah. And we're looking for responses because they're thoughtful and they're grounded. And we need that in order to be safe and sound and secure around a thousand or, you know, I mean, if somebody has a draft horse, we're looking at a 2,000, 2,500 pound animal. We want to be safe and sound and enjoy our hobby. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You, you don't, you don't want to be all wound up and super tense because then they pick up on it and you want to have some um, constructive impact on the animal or your horse, because if you're all wound up and stressed out, um, <laughs> They're going to express that and i know i'm just i'm laughing not because i think that it's funny um well, part of me i think that's it's funny but just that the opportunity for growth and development that comes from building and and maintaining that connection with your horse and really frankly with any animal but but specifically because of the size of horses um it's a it's a really good you know sounding board to give feedback about where we're at in our yeah you know and we've got um, you know, we've got dogs and cats a lot in our lives, um, and they're, they're predators like we are, so we actually, it's easier for us to relate to them, you know. Our claws come out, <laughs> cats' claws come out. Yeah. Um, horses are just very different, and so it's a wonderful learning opportunity to put ourselves in the shoes of a, of a different species that has, to some extent, different needs than we have. You know, we humans very much... We, by nature, we, we're, we're a pack animal, right? So there is the, what I call the cave, the cave woman in us, you know, that is in our, um, in, in our lizard brain, right? And it's all about feeling safe and secure and being part of something and, and getting safety and security out of that. But then there's also that other part in us where we want to be an individual, right? And a lot of times in horse training, uh, we're making our horse an individual, and it's not. A horse is always a family member. A whole horse is always a member of the herd. And can they deal with what we're expecting them to do? To some extent, they do every day because look at it. The majority of horsemanship is that way. But do they really thrive? And do can they be really the partner that they could be? if we would address that a little bit more, you know? And this whole idea of personal growth, that's why it's genuine connections that you create with your horse, with yourself and others. And that's the part that, you know, where I wholehearted communication goes into fearless insight, the fourth building block of genuine connections, because at some point um, we can all relate to what our horse is doing um, and we're looking at ourselves and sometimes that doesn't feel all that good. I was years ago, I was um, at a clinic and I had watched all day long um, this gentleman being really uh, almost abusive to his horse. He was yanking and jerking on the horse's mouth and spurring it. And the poor thing was just all miserable and was just trying to do what the human was asking him to do and was so tense and tight that I thought, you know what, if, if I might just leave after lunch because I cannot watch stuff like that. And so I, I kind of peeked after lunch and, and the clinician actually um, had the human get off his horse and he was riding the horse and he said, you know, our horses are always mirroring us. And then there was this long pause and by the way, the horse looked completely different. It was relaxed. The kink in the neck was gone. The eyes were soft. 
the nose, the, the, the mouth, the chin was soft, there was no more tail swishing, and um, he was just really gently, you know, riding into the herd of cows. And uh, he and then he said, so the horse is mirroring us, and we don't always like what we see. And then there was a really, really long pause. And then he said, and some people just buy another horse. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm like, I like you, you know, yeah. because it's it's not a matter of sometimes we have, there's this really interesting phenomena, right? I believe whatever horse you have shows up in your life for a reason. Yeah. It is there to teach you something. Anything that shows up in our life is there to teach us something. But, you know, my specialty is horses and I truly, truly believe. And I know that people say, well, this horse isn't for me, you know, this is too much horse for me. This is, I can't handle this. And, you know, we have lots of reasons why we look for a new home for our horses or plain just get rid of them, right? Yeah. Um, but, but I believe there is always an opportunity in it. We just might not be willing to see the opportunity and we might not be willing to adjust to the opportunity that is presenting to us, right? When it comes to horses, there is a lot of um, goals involved, right? We're, we're humans are very goal orientated. We are very much of a performance society, you know. Uh, kids, little kids need to perform at an early age, early age, you know. And it goes through our whole, um, through our whole adulthood. I have a friend of mine that was very much taught as a child to perform, and. It, she's been noticing with her horse that it's hard to just be and horses doing that a lot because she's so conditioned to, I need to do stuff. I need to do stuff. I need to move forward. I need to perform. And that's not what our horses are about. Um, so right. we really need to have a foundation uh, of a very genuine connection for our horse to go that extra mile for us to perform right and we need to have that first in order to um really do it in a way where it's healthy and for the horse and where there's peace love and joy in in that whole interaction and that's really important for me yeah yeah i i, I think that, i think that one of the things one, you said that that really jumped out to me was the story about that. Was it a trainer that you were with and that, you, that the horse wasn't, he wasn't treating the horse very nice or whatever? It was a participant in the clinic um, okay. that um, wasn't treating his, his horse very nice and the trainer actually made him get off the horse and watch that the horse can absolutely do what he wants him to do as long as he asks differently, right? Yeah. Well, when, when you said that, what came to me was <clears throat> it's like the, the animal or the horses are essentially a mirror for our um, own development, you know? Mm -hmm. So you look at, oh, well, you know, this horse is ridiculous and acting and I can't tame it or not tame it. I don't know the proper terminology, but like I can't feel like I can't maintain or gain control to have that connection to be able to be in sync. Um, but in reality, it's actually just mirroring back or they're mirroring back uh what is being expressed through the human yeah and Absolutely. and i think that some people i mean humbly from my experience in, in 15 16 years of coaching professionally in the health field um with humans uh there there are just people who don't want to hear that they don't want to hear that the problems that they're facing in life or financially mentally emotionally spiritually and on really all different areas of life are just mirroring feedback to them to see the opportunities for growth and development. But uh, the decision that some people I think more often than not uh, decide to make is that, well, it's it's external circumstances that are happening to me um, and these things are happening and it's not. It, it certainly couldn't be me that's causing this issue with my horse, right? Um, yeah, and it's, it takes courage, you yeah. know, to get ourselves because I, I know from myself a few years ago, um, I had to um, meet certain requirements in my horsemanship to continue to be an instructor. 
And uh, it was something that was just kind of put out there on very short notice. And it was on purpose um, designed to do it that way, which, you know, when you want to set people up for um, relationships, then that's not really the way to go about it. But that's a different, you know, different story. But I saw myself become really competitive and it became about the task that I needed to check off the list. And I saw that my horses responded in ways that weren't, it wasn't pretty. <laughs> I right. came out to, you know, usually I come out to the porch and my horses all come in and, you know, they all want to be there with me. And when I came out on the porch, um, especially my gelding JB, he's a very opinionated Morgan gelding, you know, and he's got this attitude with a big mane and hair and, you know, he shakes his head and everything. And so he saw me coming and he turned around and hauled ass in the other direction. <laughs> there, and I'm like, I sit there and I'm like, that was direct feedback and it didn't feel very good, right? And then right. we can the horse and we can say oh you know stupid horse and all of that but in the end it was what I did the day before that he didn't appreciate and he let me know and so I really I really had a long long uh conversation with myself about that you know how important are those tasks to me and right. how important is it and in the end I met the requirements but it it left an aftertaste with me because um when it's just about the task we're missing out on the relationship, you know, whether we do that to ourselves when it just becomes to the task or whether we do it with the animals or whether we do it with other people, we really need to put that connection and the relationship first. And that sometimes simply means to say no to things that we would love to do, or we have to say, you know, not yet. Uh, doesn't mean that I can ever do it, but maybe I need to say I can't go on the trail, right? Because my horse is not in a frame of mind to be able to go in the trailer today in a way where I'm not causing harm to the relationship, right? Right. So, yeah. Yeah, I think it's just, it's brilliant because it's, um, the way you do anything is the way you do everything. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and the way that this, you take your opportunity of, uh, you know, growth or just development or feedback um, to, to that it's um, learning how, as you said, with your, the one horse that didn't like what you did, and then he let you know the next day. And if you weren't ready for it, you could have just easily got <laughs> frustrated and that, well, it's, you know, it's his fault or he's just acting out or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, but really just giving feedback. And I think, yeah, I think that's the self awareness part. And I've noticed that uh, has been a, an ongoing kind of consistent theme or thread with a lot of the animal wellness uh, presenters um, in that they, they, that I've heard them in their presentations when we do coaching calls that um, it's more often that the work that they do is not just with the animal and or the pet, the dog, the cat, the horse, um, or even maybe the birds, but it has a lot more to do with the, the human or the person, the pet parent, whatever, um, that it's it's they're doing a lot of work with the humans too because they're impacting the relationship so so much right absolutely you know it goes back to um we need to have the willingness to to gather new information and to learn new things right it that, that applies to everyday life as much as to horsemanship we have to have that willingness and that openness you know as soon as we say oh that's not for me i already know that then we're closing ourselves off from learning. And sometimes, and it has happened to me too, sometimes I learn something that I do not personally want to do, but I always ask this question, how can that help me in my situation? How can that be valuable to me? And so I open myself up to new experiences. So that needs to happen first, right? But then the awareness needs to be there. So willingness and then awareness and simply just noticing. And the big thing that I'm telling my students always is take inventory and simply observe what your horse is telling you. You know, where is the tension in his body? You know, is the eye hard or is it soft? Is there a really tight chin with a lot of wrinkles in that around the nose and mouth or not? The, the nerve endings around the nose and mouth actually are connected with the limbic system and that is the system in our brain that is responsible for emotions 
So if the nose and mouth are tight, tense and tight, the emotions are tense and tight as well. Um, how can I, a lot of horses have tension in their neck, right? They might even cock their hind leg and they look kind of relaxed, but they have kind of the head stuck out and you can feel, you know, tension in the pole and in their neck area. And it's, we have to learn to read our horses and our horses body language right and it happens very quickly horses are 10 times faster than humans are so we simply have to school our eye and take inventory and simply observe what is my horse telling me so then i have a basis where i can you know engage strategies to help my horse through the anxiety or through the fear or through the upsetness or even if I have a horse that is very dominant, you know, to help my horse find a platform where he sees me as the lead and he respects me for that. You know, we have passive horses and we have dominant horses in the herd. So the dominant horse is the one that always moves the other ones around, right? This is my spot, go away. This is my hay and you can't drink right now. And by the way, I just feel like you need to move, so go away. This is kind of the dominant horse. and. They are always interested in movement and they always have a communication about space, yeah? So that dominant horse will lean into your personal space, that dominant horse will step on your feet and will be very rude when, when you're leading it, um, you know, trying to yank and jerk on the rope and all of that. Because they simply say, you know, are you the lead today? And they might ask that question every day for a long time that I need. So I can actually settle in and follow you and feel you you deserve, you know, for me to consider you as a lead because they have so much confidence in themselves already, right? If we have a horse that's afraid, it's a whole lot easier to give that horse confidence, even when we're coming from a um, dominant uh, perspective, right, in horsemanship. Most horsemanship is very dominant and is interested in movement and making the horse behave and making the horse think. So even causing the horse, that's still dominant, right, because we're looking for a response and we're attached to that outcome, which makes us dominant. So, but a, a horse that is fearful is a whole lot easier to provide that, that basis of, you know, um, Never mind, you know, I'm taking care of you and I'm taking control of the situation and the horse might just settle down into this. Um, what we want to be is the lead, right? The lead mare that um, doesn't look around and say, uh, hey guys, are you for you back there? You, you really got to, you know, we're, the lead is not doing this, right? The lead is moving on, is moving forward and knows the rest of the herd will follow them. And the stallion behind will, you know, make sure that everybody catches up. But the lead is not somebody that moves the other herd animals around because she was chosen because of her experience, her wisdom, and making benevolent decisions for the whole herd. So movement, as in moving other horses around, is not part of being the lead. The lead knows that the horse a herd will always follow her and never questions that, right? So there is a different attitude behind that. And that's what I'm really encouraging people to think of when they interact with the horses. So it's not about control. It's not about being dominant. It's also not about somebody that, you know, gives a treat for every little thing the horse does because by nature, horses want safety first, right? Um, feed and eating is is the last part and we cannot treat away fear it's not possible okay you can do a, and i'm not against treats by any shape or form my horses get lots of uh positive reinforcement with treats but it's the attitude that i have behind it right can i give my horse a place of you're 100 percent safe with me i will never ever put you in a situation where you don't feel safe. I take care of your safety. I take care of my safety. I take care of the herd of two. I will never ever put you in a situation where you lose your trust or your confidence and your connection with me, right? That's the basis. So can I lead my horse in the trailer, even if it's a little bit worried, 
and then I can give the horse a treat because then it can chew and relax and there's a positive reinforcement. Or do I have to stand there with a grain bucket and lure the horse into the trailer and then slam the door shut, right? What are the chances my horse will go in the trailer next time? Yeah, right. <clears throat> yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty powerful. I think um, I had to have my blue light glasses on there. Ever since I started wearing these things, um, I have had a hard time. I have a second monitor up as well, so that's why I take them off because the glare. I think I find it's annoying because then you can't really see my face or my eyes. Um, but I, I, the more that I've been wearing them, this is totally unrelated, but kind of related to what you're talking about from a ner nervous system standpoint. Is that uh, if I have the, if I don't have them on as much now, I've been finding this strain in my eyes has been pretty pretty intense because um, oh. I'm spending a lot more time behind a computer screen. Um, so there's no yeah. prescription and it's just the, the blue light blocking but but at any rate um with what you just said there i know i wanted to bring this up kevin um haney which by the way hi kevin and wendy from i think wisconsin or somewhere out there in the midwest and uh they're him and his wife uh, wendy are platinum members so uh, it's pretty cool i love seeing you guys on here so just saying animals horses are very smart animals they sense your feelings at the time you're riding them and then he had commented on this I think at one point you had mentioned about the ears are a good place to see um, how they are feeling. Yes, absolutely. You know, um, there is a difference whether the ears are back because our horse is upset or whether the ears are back in just a resting position. There is a difference whether the ears are forward and the horse is alert and is actually afraid of what's happening or because it's anticipating something that's positive, right? Yeah. The position of the ears and the rest of the body um, really correspond to how the horse is feeling. And Kevin makes such a good point, you know, horses do feel how we feel when we're riding them. And I see a lot of times, you know, as much as we uh, use dominant principles when it comes to our horses, uh, a lot of times uh, people that have horses use dominant principles amongst each other, you know, get on that horse and show him who's fast and don't be a wussy and get over yourself. I mean, I've heard it all, right? And um, I've seen people get on horses that are not rideable and they're getting in, in uh, they're crossing their thresholds, right? And that's where this fearless insight comes in. We. We not only need to address our horses' thresholds in play, approach, and retreat, we need to uh, address our own thresholds. So that goes right back to that healthy physiology of being in balance. I remember we had a student at the ranch, and it was a fear management class. So those were all students that already had some kind of confidence issues around horses. And guess what? Um, I had a really, really scary experience years and years ago. And it got to the point where I sat on my horse crying uncontrollably, being unable to get off. And all of that had started because somebody made me get on, on the horse and I felt that I couldn't take care of myself and I just had to listen to somebody, what somebody else was telling me to do, you know? I yeah. had a choice, but I felt I was, I had to get on the horse and it ended very, very poorly with me getting bucked off a second time and I was sliding with my face, you know, face face in the ground, sliding forward. <laughs> and I opened my eyes and uh, the fence post was right there in front of my nose. Yeah. Um, I didn't get seriously hurt. I was unbelievably extremely lucky because the horse at this point was really wanted to get me off uh, for good reasons. Uh, I don't blame him for that. Um, but what it did for me was it, it, this question came up, but what if, and it can happen, right? And then we're getting older and you know, you, you have kids and you worry more about the family. Uh, the, the easier it is to then go um, and, and have these fear patterns show up in with our horses, right? Because not only our horses are afraid, so Kevin was saying, I learned at an early age when showing horses in Hunter and Jumper that your confidence or lack of it, the horse feels that so they will not perform at their peak because we are not at our peak. That's absolutely true. So um, a lot of times we're trying to push ourselves forward. Again, it goes into that performance mode and we don't observe our own threshold. We're already not observing our horse's thresholds. 
and that can end really poorly. And that's where it goes back to fearless insight, where we really have to learn a lot about ourselves and who we are and why we do the things that we do. And a lot of the things that, you know, I, I go by the, the four pillars of, of human behavior. So I already talked about the cave woman, you know, that is all about how we are all similar and how we all have that desire for safety and security. We want to fit in. We want to be a part of something because that's our pack mentality, right? We want to be part of the tribe. And then the second one is our personality, how we're different. We're all unique. We're all the snowflakes, unique as snowflakes, right? We all are valuable because there's only one of us on this earth in those 7 billion people that we now have, I think. And we all can contribute something special and unique because we are so unique. And then there's our, our story, the way, why we are the way we are, right? And that goes back into our childhood and what society we grew up in, what family, what religion. And a lot of times we're taking belief patterns and value patterns from somebody else and making those ours. And when we kind of get into our age, then we start to question that and a whole nother load of garbage shows up, right? Mm -hmm. and that's where I think the biggest part is is that fourth pillar where it's really it's it's our story that we get to write right and i was listening to brene brown the other day and i absolutely loved what she said she said when when you own your story you get to write the ending yeah that's great right and so when we own our story and when we allow ourselves to be our authentic self that's the only way how our Kunda horse will truly, genuinely connect with us. Because you can force connection, right? I can make a horse, even at liberty, stay with me, right? I can chase it around and I make can make every spot in the arena more unpleasant than being with me and the horse will be with me, right? I can totally do that. But the thing is, the, still, the horse is only next to me because that's the least amount of pressure that it is feeling because I create more pressure when it's not with me, right? Uh, you might have seen that where people stand in the middle and other people are shaking plastic bags or sticks with ropes and things like that. And they're, they're making it unpleasant for the horse to not face the human and then the horse faces the human. That's forced connection. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about that the horse absolutely free will chooses you and says you are my lead i follow you because you have deserved the honor to be my lead and we can only do that if we're authentic when we own our story when we take care of the heart wounds we all have heart wounds and most of the time what we do when we have heart wounds we create a wall and then we create another wall and then we create another wall, right? And um, we're trying not to feel the negative things in life, right? But then we also don't feel all the wonderful positive things because we can't be choosy what we feel or don't feel. We either feel or we don't feel. The horse knows whether we have heart wounds and the horse knows whether we carry a wall or not because they feel that we're not our authentic self. They, they, they know that we are not true to ourselves and we're trying to be somebody we're not because they're so intuitive and they're so observant being a prey animal. They know whether the, the zebras know whether the lion is at the water hole to drink water or whether it's out to get somebody. And they will absolutely stand next to the lion at the water hole because they have that amount of intuition. So they know whether we're, we're out to, to grab a drink of water or whether we're out to get them, right? They just right. know. Yeah, that, it's, it's pretty amazing. Um, the, the one thing you said that stood out to me, I mean, I've, there's been more than just one, but the one, since, since you were just talking in that little segment, the one thing that stood out to me was the part about the about fear and that that it's it really does serve us I, I can't remember exactly what you said but you said something about um, the horse uh, will you know through 
you, you don't need to apply a force um, and or forms of fear in order to get control or to get a, a connection or a relationship um, to be the lead to be, by using force or fear. Um, it doesn't have to. There's a more evolved way of doing it, right? And yeah. um, and I think that the other important element too is that fear um, really, as I like to refer to it, as an acronym. Uh, there's different different ways to look at it, but false evidence appearing real, and mm -hmm. that it does actually serve. You know, when you look at the intuition, the intuition comes in. You said what? What did you say the animal was that would go up beside the line at the water hole and start drinking? What's that? Oh, zebra. Right. So there is a certain level of fear in protection that's built into our survival instincts as human beings and animals. So I think I've heard that before. Where it's, it's completely delusional to think that us as human beings and animals are not going to experience fear in a way that serves us for our higher good in the sense that if they're like, oh, well, yeah, no, I'm just, you know, I, I'm, I'm super positive all the time and I never have negative feelings. I'm, I'm playing a little joke here. I'm an animal and I never get fearful and everything's just fine. Well, there it, in, in that little analogy, well, the day that the lion's hungry, that zebra is not going to exist any longer. So I think it's good to kind of separate that. And I love how you said that, that it's, um, you can earn that right or that respect from the animal to be the lead. Um, yeah. And really in general, I mean, in, 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 in business and life and for me as a father, as a husband, um, I don't, to, to be able to earn that respect and authority or position of being the father and the husband of the house, I can't demand it. I have to earn that um, through my actions. And that's the only way I'm going to, uh, you know, I feel like I can obtain that. And I think that that same, same, uh, it's the same level of relationship goes into what you're talking about with your animals. So I just think that, or to the, to the horses, but I just think it's neat to kind of make for me anyways, make those parallels and see the, the purpose of them. Yeah, absolutely, you know, and there is that fear that serves as well, right? Yeah. Um, I had a friend of mine say the other day she, she got bucked off her horse and she said, well, I looked at it, you know, and it, it didn't look quite okay, but I thought, yeah, I'll, I'll be fine. <laughs> you know, I can write that. And there was, there was a serious amount of fear missing, right? Right. That... that um, caused her to think that she would be okay riding the horse that that wasn't very present. And it, right. it, it very poorly, you know, she got bucked off and the horse was so scared that it ran into the fence, you know, big pipe fencing and yep. bent the top of the pipe fencing over. And then out of that experience, you know, first mental, emotional distress, now physical pain, he turned around and came back and, and ran over her while she was still laying on the ground. Oh, wow. And those are accidents that, that happen, you know, because we, we don't always quite understand our horse and what they're trying to tell us. And so there is, when, when I teach about genuine connections, it's so important for me to help people understand, to read the horse. You know, our horse can't tell us, hey, I hurt here and this is not okay and I'm afraid of that and you know what, you suck today. Um, and that's why I'm turning my butt on you and running off like my horse did, you know, JB. Um, it's really, really important to understand that there is a good fear that keeps us safe and there's that irrational fear that I experienced after my accident. I mean, I made my brain made up all kinds of stories, right? Because I consistently um, stepped over my threshold into panic zone because everybody else told me this is what I needed to. I just needed to get back on that darn horse. And when I finally allowed myself to find my own threshold, my threshold started in the house thinking about going outside. And once I realized that, and I had a student that had a similar, and I think I don't finish that, that story, I started telling it, but we had a student that um, realized that actually approaching her horse, opening the gate, putting the halter on, leading her horse out of the pen, put her in panic zone. And she had not realized that for a long, long time because she was so 
trying so hard not to feel what she was feeling, you know. So she overlooked the pounding heart and she overlooked the butterflies in her stomach and she overlooked her her sweaty hands and all those crazy stories that her brain was making because she was pushing forward, pushing forward, pushing forward. And then our brain, you know, goes into these crazy stories that get bigger by the time, by by the minute because it desperately tries to keep us safe, right? So observing our own threshold, observing our horse's threshold, this is something that those are all life skills, you know, that's why genuine connections, it's not just about horsemanship, it's about life skills. And our horses are so generous with their feedback because it's instant. And we cannot look at good or bad. We just need to look at what is yeah. inventory and allow ourselves, you know, if it's upsetting to us, you know what, that's okay. Be upset, you know. If if you feel sad because your horse is rejecting you, that's okay. Allow yourself to feel that because I bet that shows up in other areas of your life too. Allowing ourselves to feel the way we feel when it comes to our horse and just showing up as our authentic self and not trying to be somebody we're not. And then from there on, we can create, after we create inventory, we can create a plan to where we want to go. Hours. We need to know where we're at and we need to know where we want to go. And then we figure out the rest in between. And so that's a big part of um, doing coaching with me, you know, where I help people that say, okay, I'm, I'm right now in a place where I, I am so afraid I can't even really go out and feed my horses anymore. It makes me sick to my stomach and I want to go trail riding. This is my goal. And so we go in between, right? Right. And it's, 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 it's a beautiful journey, like everything in life, you know, it's not always easy. Nobody has promised us a bed of roses here on earth school. You know, it's not always easy, but I think it's cherishing our horse for what he is and the feedback that he's giving us and having that opportunity to fill another being's needs to set them up for success and to set ourselves up for success, you know, whether it's with healthy physiology, wholehearted communication, fearless insight, uh, gives us the opportunity to live to our fullest potential. Right. And that's so amazing about being around horses and coming from a perspective of genuinely connecting versus trying to control our horse and our life for that matter, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's <clears throat> lots of lessons for just in general in life. And I realize I'm off the screen. <laughs> um, just lots of lessons, really. Um, and, and that's a neat part. And I think just uh, the the value of just a couple of the little insights. I, I know that for those of you who are on with us live still, I know Kevin um, said that I wish I had Valor Oil when I was riding. <laughs> um, I think I did finally, at first I was like, well, you can just go get some Valor Oil, which by the way, if some of you are wondering, that's an essential oil from a young living called Valor, uh, which really helps instill confidence and courage. Um, and I think he was saying that because, well, when I was riding more, he now probably knows how effective it is and it would have helped him to have a better connection maybe. <laughs> and it helps with the horses so wonderfully to balance the horses too, you know. Yeah. Um, I had somebody tell me Valor is the, is the chiropractor in the bottle. Yep. Um, and it, it really helps the horses. Do we have time for a quick story about essential oils? Yep. Yeah, let's do that and then we'll wrap up with, I wanna show your website and the monthly mini masterclass um, with the link. Sounds great. So part of healthy physiology, I, I do use oils. I use Hanna somatics, um, homeopathics. Um, I have a really good bet that does acupuncture. I use the red light, like Eva survey, you know, who's part of the animal wellness summit. Yeah. It's a good of mine. So I always try to use modalities that I can um, pass on to my students. So something they can do themselves, you know, because everybody has a limited budget and um, modalities they tease that we can do ourselves in that foster connection. And so a few years ago, I had a student of mine, we, she was going back to Texas and 
uh, the wind was, we were doing a trailer loading session and her horse had a really hard time. The wind was blowing and it just was really hard for my student to stay balanced while her horse was so frantic. And so she had a totally emotional breakdown and she sat on the trailer fender and she was crying and she said, this effing horse and this effing wind and this effing trailer. And <laughs> <laughs> it was just a total mental breakdown and oh. this sweet lady that never cusses and that is just absolutely wonderful and cares so much about the horse but she in that moment just lost it right. and i felt so much for her that i said you don't worry i'll drive with you to texas okay we're doing this together you're getting my support I know your horse is a mess today. I know you are a mess today, but tomorrow you will not. And we'll just do this together. So I went on a 15 hour trip and she flew me back to Texas and we were in Kansas and there was a terrible wind, 60 mile hour winds. We had to pull off the interstate and with many, many other big trucks stand in this uh, gas station and lots of noises and the wind howling and the trailer rattling and her horse was really really good loading and had just trailer beautifully and in that moment it just lost it and there was very little that we could do so i got my peace and calm out and i just lathered my hand with it because i knew i probably just had one moment to make an impact and the horse was turning around in the trailer we didn't tie her because she wasn't used to that it was a stock trailer so i waited until her butt swung around and I pushed my hand on her sternum and I made contact. And I'm telling you, I felt in that moment how all that anxiety in split seconds just melted out of her and she stopped and she looked at me and that was it. <laughs> just like that. So, so power, power, powerful, right? And we had a good trip. We made it all the way to Houston. And um, it was a wonderful experience for me. So uh, yes, valor, peace and peace and calm, whatever we use yeah. makes a big difference for us humans and makes a big difference for us. Yeah. yeah, peace and calming, stress away and valor um, and Rudavala, uh, some of those. Uh, Tranquil is another good blend. So they're just, they are, they, aside from that, just how I, I I just had a client yesterday tell me one of my private personal training clients tell me that you know when they use lavender and stress and frankincense for specific reasons during the day things go better they sleep better they better focus and then I said okay so just because then they're like well did, is it really the oils like I don't know like how was I feeling before I'm like well just stop using them so they stopped using them and I really believe strongly that they need to be used as a tool not as a dependency to you know, cover up an imbalance to just use them as a natural yeah. band aid to, you know, as my mentor would say as a joke, you can't keep living like an idiot and treat your garbage, your stomach like a garbage can and then use a whole bunch of um, uh, essential oils or supplements to try and patch that up. But, but it is, thanks for sharing that because it is, it, they are that effective and it's neat to see. And for those of you who aren't using them or haven't, there's a lot, we have lots of great training and education in the summit um, that, the presenters who have lots of experience teaching you how to be, you know, the things to be uh, conscious of and, and careful um, about what oils to use, not to use with certain animals. Um, and the, the, the golden principle is less is more. That's really uh, what I've learned um, to be true. So thank you for sharing that. Um, so what I want to do now is I'm actually going to pull us both off the screen for a second. Um, if I can do this properly i just need to pull so what we're going to do so Petra, thank you so much um for coming on here again and and sharing your wealth of wisdom with us and um and for all of you listening kevin um and back down here the other two ladies kathy and susan and then everybody else who's on here who's not commenting um usually i know people are like i love being on their live but i don't want to comment or say anything um <laughs> you just want to watch and observe or if you're watching this as a replay just you know yeah, totally, it's totally fine. I'm just acknowledging you that we know you're there. Um, and to just share this uh, when you're watching this, maybe on YouTube and our members area, um, to just share this with others because, again, we do this so that we can keep reaching um, out further and further uh, to more people around yeah. the world who really need the, the, the training. 
you know, the education. A ripple effect. Yeah, for sure. Um, and that's what I'm really, really passionate about. See, it looks like you guys are seeing the monthly mini masterclass. Yes. Which we did uh, just a little while ago. And I would encourage you guys, if you're passionate about natural horse habitat and you want to learn more, what I'm doing in this session, basically, I lead you through the way how to set up the natural horse habitat and give you specific ideas how to plan it, what tools to use so that it's horse friendly and user friendly and pocket friendly. Because I really believe that horse ownership can be affordable. You see me here on my balcony in um, Pagosa Springs and the Natural Horse Habitat Shelter is in the background. And I know that, you know, a lot of us humans want to have wonderful, fancy barns. Um, your horse doesn't need a fancy barn. It just needs a very simple shelter. And the Habitat Shelter is just that. And I have two of them on my property and the material was $950 per shelter. And the way I set it up, I didn't need a building permit. I talk more about that in my ultimate planning guide for the uh, natural horse habitat, which you guys also get when you sign up for the three-step blueprint. So it's $27, super affordable. And if you have any questions, whether you sign up for the mini masterclass or not, you're always welcome to check in with me at magic at petrachristensen.com. I have lots of introverted students. I, I have a masterclass where students join me for a whole year. And um, we have a Facebook group, a closed Facebook group. And the extroverts share all the videos on the yeah. Facebook group. And the introverts share them privately with me. So it's totally <laughs> Okay, if you want to send a private email, go for it. I'm happy to connect with you this way. Whatever floats your boat is fine with me, whether you're going to do it in public or totally private. I just would love for you to connect. Yeah, that's great. And yeah, so when you go to the page, the link is is in the comments here. I'll put it on here. Just click on that blue button. It'll take you to the order form, which, by the way, if you're like Kevin um, or Jennifer that was on earlier, um, you as VIP and platinum members don't need to purchase it, um, but every, everybody else needs. We just want to make this stuff available to make it affordable, so you get the video, the audio, and the transcript um, as as a download. So you purchase it, you can watch it in our members area, and uh, you can download it so that you own it forever. Um, and as Paige has been very generous with her time and also being available, this is her website, uh, PaigeChristensen.com. P E T R A C H R I S T E N S E N dot com. And she has some great free resources on here, which I think is awesome. And that little circle, I think you have right here. So there you start to see it come together, um, which is pretty neat. There you oh. see the individual building blocks of genuine connections. I also, when you go to free resources on the top, the top here, yeah. So, um, this brings you to some downloads, but also to the, see the magic, that's where the magic is in the library. Um, it brings you to the Genuine Connections Library, and there are tons of articles and videos. My friend Steph always says, you should charge for that. You're giving too much value away. <laughs> <laughs> it'll, it'll come back to you. <laughs> but I so passionately believe to give you guys hands-on advice that you go on my website, do you go to the Czech Genuine Connections Library yeah. and you, you pick whatever building block you want to concentrate on, whether it's natural or habitat, the healthy physiology, the wholehearted communication or the fearless insight. And there are dozens of articles that you can immediately use and apply to yourself and your horse and the situation. And there is a comment section under each article. And that's where you can ask your questions. Or like I said, you can email me personally. So there's lots of value there, totally free, no yeah. strings attached. You don't have to give me your email to go into the library. It's all there for you to use and get an idea what Genuine Connection is all about. And then if you're really passionate and really excited, you can contact me and see what, what else I can offer for you that will really help you to to uh, progress and propel you and your horse for it right that's great i i appreciate it and um 
yeah, that, you know, it's like that with the, the summit, you know, it's a lot of work. We do work behind the scenes all year for the logistics with the presenters. We had three presenters apply last week um, who wanted to be on board for this year. And so, you know, things are growing. I feel like there's so many things that we've learned already in the first two years, but I feel like also, and we've accomplished a lot, but there's also still a lot to do and feel like we're just getting started, but um, just want to keep, keep growing. And for you all, as uh, members of our community, whether it's free or paid, either way, it's cool, um, is that uh, I just encourage you to go in and, and continue to look into Patriot's work or any other presenter and support them, buy their products, their courses, their trainings, whatever, because that's how we can continue to keep putting out more great uh, resources to reach more and more for those that maybe don't have it in their budget or choose not to put it in their budget quite yet. But uh, that's that's great. So any last words that you want to share with us before we end off today? Well, again, thank you so much for having me on here. Um, it's a I feel very passionate about genuine connections. And so it's Let's always good to share. <laughs> there, there is a personal story behind that. Um, and it goes back to my childhood. We were talking about heart wounds and it comes from, from a little heart wound that I had and I felt very passionate about. And it took me a while to make the connection why I am so passionate about genuine connections and why I go out of my way to do this. So I would really, really encourage you guys the next time you're with your animal or the next time you're with your horse, um, just be there for a little while and feel your horse and feel yourself and look what it will take to create that genuine connections. And then if yeah. you want to extra help, feel free to reach out because I am here to support you and your horse. Awesome. Horses. Yeah. <laughs> Singular or plural. So great. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, I got to keep moving. I know you guys probably have to too. Uh, and Petra does as well. Um, so thank you again for those of you tuning in live, for watching the replay, for sharing it. Um, last couple of things, uh, we have um, Trisha working is on for monthly mini masterclass. I'm actually going to be sending an email out uh, hopefully today with giving you guys, and it's going to post it on the Facebook page because she has, she couldn't decide. There's three topics that she wants to, that she feels are going to be really impactful. So we're going to do a little poll. So you get to pick. Uh, whichever one is the most requested topic she's going to do the monthly mini masterclass on later this month um and it's uh, i know some people with her work because uh, she talks about connecting with our pets and animals after they've transitioned or just energetically some people think it's you know kind of woo woo where it's out there but i think that uh, when we have done these calls in the past uh there's a lot of interest because there's there's you know we outlive most of our pets and animals and then dealing with that it can kind of catch you off guard. And I experienced that this week when Lucy, or pardon me, this year, or pardon me, last year, uh, when Lucy just, uh, our little dog just disappeared. Um, and we were pretty sure that she was not, she was ill and she just ran away to go transition or to, you know, to say die. But Brent Atwater would correct me and say transition. Yeah. And, um, and, and it just, it was kind of, it was challenging. So it kind of caught us off guard. Um, and I, we find at times like when McKenna, our little, oldest daughter um gets really sad or upset then she's like oh, she just starts crying it's so um heart-wrenching she's like i just miss lucy so much and she's like just starts crying and like when are like when are we going to get another dog and and you know we're building a new house and we're like we need to get settled in a new house before we bring a new puppy into the family and um so anyways all that to say that's up and coming later this month and your story that you just kind of briefly alluded to you know you see the purpose of whatever that incident was that caused that perceived void, which now has created your value in life for creating general genuine connections. And you look at the work that you're doing um, and seeing how that experience served you and um, maybe not at the time from your perception, but now in your life's work that it's helped you to get to bring your, your, your work out to the world. Yeah. You know, it's, um, we can't always, we don't always have a choice what, what happens to us, right? Especially as a child. Um, and even losing a pet, which is, you know, an external um, influence and experience, you know, that can have a lifelong impression on us. And it, how our parents respond and how we get to respond as we get older can make all the difference. So, yeah. totally makes sense. 
for sure. Yeah, so um, that's it. I was going to say something else, but oh, I was going to mention about AWS Live, but I'll, we'll leave that for later for the live event we're doing uh, later this year. So we're going to, we're still working that behind the scenes. So uh, <clears throat> stay blessed. What's I that? I want to be there. Yes, you'll be there. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, no, I think I'm pretty, pretty confident that you'll be there for sure. Yay. Um, yeah, so stay blessed, stay grateful, stay humble, stay hungry, keep on the path, keep learning, and uh, thanks for tuning in, guys. We'll talk to you guys in the future next week, I believe, with the calls again at 1 o'clock. Um, and uh, I know that many of you who can't get on live that you're watching this still as a replay because I talked to seven people this week that are like, you know, if you had the calls later at night, you know, I could get on live. But remember that even if you can't get on live, you can email your questions in. Um, and we have tested the times and we did nighttime calls and they – we didn't they didn't necessarily change the participation uh, we might maybe test them a little bit later but we're finding that the one that this time slots working really well um but you can always listen to the replay and you can always send in your questions beforehand so thanks for tuning in guys have a great rest of your day and thank you again Petra. i really really appreciate you doing so all right okay see you everybody okay